Uh, my name is Robert Kelly. I'm the host and writer of the show Record All Monsters. I also wrote a book, which you can buy from me, or we do have a game show at the end of the thing. And you can win it if you choose to participate and win. Uh, <laughs> so, we're going to be talking today about the movie... Uh, what's going on there? We're going to be talking about the movie uh, Legend of Dinosaurs and Monster Birds. First of all, how many of you have actually heard? Is it still up there? There we go. I think it's in there. There we go. Yeah, so how many of y'all have actually heard of Legend of Dinosaurs and Monster Board, Birds before right now? A while back, yeah. It came out in 1977 uh, in Japan. It didn't get released over in the States until 1985, which meant it was a uh, very slow to get catch the wave it was trying to catch in the States. Before we can talk about this movie, though, we have to talk about where it came from. And it came from a, a subgenre of exploitation movies known as Jaws Exploitation, which began with a very good studio action adventure horror film, Jaws, directed by Steven Spielberg. Spielberg, excuse me, which was released in June of 1975. The screenplay was by Peter Benchley based off his own novel, which if you've read the novel, it's really bad. <laughs> and you know that the, the other credited screenwriter, writer, Carl Gottlieb, did most of the heavy lifting. Um, the music in it, the iconic scores by John Williams, and it had a budget of $9 million, and it made $476 million. This was a really big deal to one guy in particular, who was not involved with the production, but was very upset by the success. Uh, and this man was Dino De Laurentiis, an Italian uh, film producer. He had made things like Dr. Zhivago. Uh, he'd done a War and Peace. He'd been involved with all sorts of high prestige films. And he was like, why the hell is everyone so excited about this dumb monster movie? I can make a dumb monster movie. And he decided that the way he was going to cash in on Jaws was to remake the first monst giant monster movie, King Kong. This came out uh, in December of 1976. It is a, uh, I don't want to say dumpster fire, I feel it's too strong, because it is competently made, but it is still a bad movie. Uh, partly because the choices... The choices made by all these creatives here, De Laurentiis, John Gillerman, who had previously directed the, the extremely po-faced uh, Towering Inferno, and the screenwriter, Lorenzo Semple Jr., who was most well known for showrunning the Adam West 1966 Batman show. So, um, and the music was by John Barry, who did the, the James Bond scores uh, through the 60s and 70s. Uh, it cost $24 million. Quite a bit of that went toward a giant King Kong robot that is on screen for about three minutes total. Um, and you, like, that's mostly in the background. There are maybe 30 seconds of seeing it in action. And uh, that was made by Carlo Rimbaldi, an Italian uh, effects man who had done some really great work, including a, a film, uh, I believe it was Woman in a Lizard Skin, a giallo directed by Lucio Fulci, where there were uh, dead dogs in the movie that were so realistic, they thought they'd actually killed dogs. And they went to an obscenity trial in Italy over that. And they had to bring in the, the prop to show. This is not on that level. <laughs> they bought all of the horse hair available in the world at that time to make this robot that barely worked. And the movie, you know, it made its money back, but it was not the same kind of success that Jaws was. Now, the way 
the exploitation movie uh, whole thing worked at the time. Which, let's make no mistake, movies like this by the mid 70s were exploitation movies first and foremost. Jaws, this Kong, they're outliers. And the way these worked is they'd see a wave, they'd try and catch it. Jaws had caught everyone off guard, not just Dino De Laurentiis. So when he announced his King Kong movie, you know, a full year before it was going to be released, which is what they do all the time now, but that was kind of unheard of, they, uh, they decided, they being other exploitation filmmakers, that they were not going to get caught flat-footed by this one. And they started making Kong exploitation movies. And Kong exploitation movies, we got, you know, over the next couple of years, well, they actually, uh, the South Korean American co production, APE, which stands for Attacking Primate Monster, the E at the end of Monster capitalized. Uh, they they beat they beat King Kong to theaters by two months in the U.S. And then Queen Kong, German British co-production that is actually very funny. It's a parody. It's deliberately funny. It's not good, but some of the jokes, you know, they really land. Uh, that came out the week before. Only in Germany, though. Uh, Paramount Pictures sued successfully the, the independent studio that was producing that to keep it from being released in the US and the UK. And then we have from Shaw Brothers over in Hong Kong, Mighty Peking Man, which in addition to being a King Kong knockoff is a kind of jungle girl movie as well with light kung fu. And finally, my personal favorite, uh, Yeti, the giant of the 20th century, from a full year later, uh, Italian-Canadian co-production. It's Bananas. It has its own theme song, a disco version of O oh Fortuna, where they sing about the, the attributes of the Yeti. So, what happens when a, a movie that you're expecting to be a hit is not a hit, and you have all these ex these ripoffs in the pipeline. Well, you go back to what was the first ripoff trying to rip off? Let's see if we can do that. And for that, we have to turn to our friends at Toei Animation. Uh, Toei is most famous, I think, among casual people for their animation and specifically being the studio behind uh, the anime adaptation of Dragon Ball and Dragon Ball Z. I do want to point out, just because it's a fun little fact, in the 60s they did make a, a straight adaptation of Journey to the West, which was the inspiration for Dragon Ball, uh, which was released in the U.S. two theaters through American International Pictures as Alakazam Great. Uh, and it's, it's a lot of fun. Look, that, it's on Amazon Prime right now, I think. Um, but Toei, you know, they had been trying to kind of get into the whole live-action tokusatsu thing as well. In the 1960s, they made a uh, kind of samurai magic film based off the legend of Noble Jiraiya, which was the inspiration for Naruto, uh, that was called The Magic Serpent, which I have a still from back there, uh, where, as you can see, the, uh, the magic transformations in that traditional story. I don't know if they're in Naruto. I've never seen Naruto. Um, instead of being, they turn into an actual snake and a toad, they turn into a giant snake and a giant toad. And they fight in the middle of a, a complex. Toei was also behind the live action tokusatsu TV shows, Kamen Rider and the Super Sentai series, which were uh, later repurposed to be Power Rangers. Common Rider, they did try and bring that over after the success of the Power Rangers in the early 90s as Masked Rider, and it was not good. But Common Rider is still extremely popular in Japan. Um, the other wave we kind of have to look at that Toei was trying to capitalize on, to jump on, was this kind of cryptid mania that was happening in the 1970s around the world. And y'all know what cryptids are, right? 
It's uh, mysterious creatures that may or may not exist. And one of the big ones was the Loch Ness Monster. And with the Loch Ness Monster, we had this guy, Frank Surley. He took some pictures that were probably either driftwood or otters. I don't discount the possible existence of the Loch Ness Monster. Scientific evidence recently points to it being very large eels that live very close to the bottom of the loch, which gets very deep, which would also explain why we don't really see any. So Loch Ness Monster Mania was all the rage, and we have some more interesting photographs. That's clearer resolution of this photo has proven it, it is bubbles, and this is light against a wall <laughs> under the loch, but uh, people thought it was a flipper. But the Loch Ness Monster was huge, and Toho, which all, all of the Japanese film industry was going under at this time because television was so popular. No one wanted to go see something that, that they had to pay for that they got a rough equipment of for free at home. Toho teamed up with Hammer Studios from England because Hammer was also struggling and they were trying to stay afloat as much as they could to make a Loch Ness Monster movie called Nessie, uh, which was projected to release, as you see, first in 1976 and then delayed to 1977. Uh, that never came to fruition. But word of this film, which again, very much a combination of, well, Jaws, Animal Attack Water Movie, Loch Ness Monster, super popular, Word of this production got to Toei. And they decided they were going to beat Nessie to theaters, which they did because they got a movie out and Toho and Hammer didn't. Partly because Hammer went under about this time. And that movie was our subject today, The Legend of Dinosaurs and Monster Birds. Came out in Japan in April of 1977. Um, it did okay there, but something happened a couple of weeks later called Star Wars. And, um, uh, it came to the U.S. in 1995 on television. It was then released as The Legend of Dinosaurs on VHS here. It didn't do well in Japan. It didn't do well in the U.S. It did really well for some reason in the Soviet Union. And as they were importing the, the Heisei-era Godzilla films from 1984 on, they would build them as sequels to this film. Um, and in addition to that, Toei was so confident in this, in their, their theme park, I forget what the theme park is called, but in their theme park they put, um, they put animatronics of the monsters in one of the dark rides because they were like, oh yeah, this is going to be such a huge hit. Everyone's going to want to see these. I'd like to point out also that our, our tidal creatures are a, a Ramphorinkin pterosaur and a plesiosaurus, neither of which are birds or dinosaurs. They are respectively a, 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 a flying reptile and aquatic reptile. So now let's look a little bit at the people behind this film. I could not find a picture of the director, uh, Junji Kurata, but he was, he was a, uh, a contract director with Toei. And so he'd done all sorts of films. There is barely a recognizable pattern among his work because, again, he just, he would, they, they point, he was a point and shoot guy. Uh, the screenwriters were Iseo Matsumoto and Itra Otsu, Otsu excuse me, and they were also uh, mercenary screenwriters for Toei. The president of Toei was so confident in this film that he put his name on it as an executive producer. And uh, Fumin, Fumin, uh, Fuminori Obayashi directed the special effects and made the models for this film. 
Now, if you were in the, the panel I did yesterday, uh, he briefly came up for the film Half Human, which was a, uh, a Yeti movie from the mid-1950s, directed by Ishiro Honda. So he was still working uh, 25 years later on special effects. He played the, the Yeti in that film as well. He does not play either, uh, either creature in this one. There are a lot of people in this movie, but we really only need to focus on the two stars, uh, Sunekiko Watase and Nobiko Sawa. Um, those are their characters' names at the bottom. We don't really need to know the characters. This, this is a very A to B movie. The thing, the biggest thing we need to know about them is that he's an archaeologist, she's a medical professional, they used to date, and they run into each other while he is at this, uh, investigating a murder that happened in a cave where they found a dinosaur egg, really a pterosaur egg. So we're going to go into a few clips from the film, but I would like to point out that I am using these uh, clips from the film, which belong to Toei, uh, for the purpose of commentary, criticism, and pop cultural education. Therefore, their use is protected under Title 17, Section 107 of the U.S. Copyright Act of 1976. You can purchase a copy of this film. Uh, it's available on Blu-ray through various online retailers, usually for $20 to $30. It has both the original Japanese language track with English subtitles, as well as an English dub. Also, if you decide to volunteer for the game show and you get selected, you could win my DVD copy of this film, which is on a double feature with Octoman. How many of you have heard of Octoman? This was actually Rick Baker's first movie, Rick Baker, who ironically did the King Kong suit for the 1976 King Kong. Um, and more famously, things like Men in Black and all, he worked on Star Wars. Great, great, well-beloved guy, first movie. And so this, this includes a bunch of odd trailers. It plays really like a drive-in double feature. Uh, so if you have four hours, one night you want to kill, you can win that, you can win my book. You could win this other book that has actual dinosaurs in it. So we're gonna go over some of the clips. I am going to talk over them. Um, and I am also gonna say, I have that Blu-ray. I did not use it to source the clips because it made my computer very hot. Um, however, the DVD worked just fine. I'm gonna talk over them, we are going to kind of, I'm gonna fill in the gaps, show you where these things work in the film, how it comes along. This is our opening scene. Uh, actually, this is a little intro I forgot I put in here. For whatever reason, I can't get the, the sound to quite work, so I have a mic on my laptop playing the sound from the film. Bit of what happened? Maybe. Who knows? Who can say? There's no way of knowing. So what we have here, 1977, uh, I forget the name of it. The, the forest that is at the foot of Mount Fuji where a lot of people decide to commit suicide. Anyone know the name of that forest off the top of their head? I'm sorry? I think that's right. Um, I'm not going to attempt the pronunciation right now. This is where this scene is set. We don't know why this woman is choosing uh, to end her life, but I want to draw attention to the fact that it opens with her, her eye. She falls down this hole. This is probably the most artistic scene in the film. Again, most of it is very point and shoot. And we see that this cave is full of melting ice. And I want you all to focus, 
because I, I, I know I keep saying it's a point and shoot movie, but there's a lot of focus on eye imagery in the film. And I find that just personally fascinating. Is it to throw us off, make us think about perspective? Maybe, who knows? So there we have the egg. And the scene ends on a different eye. Uh, we see her later, right after this, really, uh, run out back into the forest. She gets uh, found by some loggers who take her to a city. She tells her story. And our main character, the uh, archaeologist, is sent to the nearest town, which happens to have a, uh, a festival celebrating the, the legend of a local water dragon at about this time every year. The, uh, equivalent to the 4th of July in this Jaws knockoff. Um, and uh, we also have, uh, in Jaws, you may recall, the, the pranksters, right? We have some kids pull a prank because of the reports of a real monster in the lake. And uh, it doesn't go particularly well for them afterwards. They asked him how it was, and he was like, yeah, a couple people saw it. Most people didn't really think it was a... Uh, uh. Hey, hurry up and get out of there! All right. We see the framing is very similar to the, uh, the lagoon shot in Jaws, where uh, the, the girl, after the pranksters do their thing, she sees in the little Lagoon for boats. The shark fin. And this is the first monster attack in the film. They don't show us too much. Oh, and we get this wonderful music for all the attacks. So we just get some real close-up glimpses, not, not really seeing the whole monster. Some teeth, uh, some flashes of scales, 
but what we do see is uh, is what he does, what results. That little girl was clearly done by an adult woman. So, um, the this couple and their child report the monster attack she saw to the police. They don't really believe it. They're like, you're a little girl. Uh, you're here at this water dragon festival. Your imagination's running away with you. And then the, the guy who was standing on the shore smoking a cigarette comes in and he's like, my friends did the prank, but for real, they were just attacked by a monster. And the police are like, okay, fine, we'll look into it. And they don't find anything. They do, however, uh, talk to the, uh, our main character's ex-girlfriend. And she and her, her friend go to invest in, they're scuba divers. So the police basically contract them to go and see if there's anything under the water. Uh, what follows is probably the most famous scene in the film, as well as uh, the goriest. So if you have a, a thing about blood, there's gonna be lots of blood here. Um, and it's the, because it's an effect scene, it's fairly impressive because our, our friend from Half Human knew what he was doing. So we're gonna go ahead and go into that. Our, our main, our female lead has been on a dive previously and she decides to take a nap in their, in their boat and her compatriot goes down to continue uh, investigating under the water. This scene I am gonna more or less shut up for because it is quite effective. The dog is fine. Thank you. 
Note the attention to the eyes once again. This is supposed to be the radio that they have on the boat. Back to eyes. At the end of that scene, you know, she's half the woman she used to be. Uh, I do think that scene is pretty effective. That's why I try not to interrupt it too much. Although I do think some of the illusion is broken by half a person reaching up uh, to grab the. Uh, and I did, I did make a mistake as I was setting that clip up. The main, the lead. Uh, character went back into the boat, into the water, and her friends stayed on the boat. So I bet some of y'all may have forgotten that our opening scene was the hatching of a pterodactyl egg, right? Because we've been so focused on the plesiosaur, right? The pterodactyl comes back out of nowhere in our next scene, and we get that excellent, you know, tense jazz music backing. Apparently the entire JSDF only has uh, one pair of binoculars between them. So the, the outpost that he's attacking, uh, they were on the lookout for the lake monster after the, the last attack. And then this thing just swoops down out of the sky, accompanied by its jazz disco soundtrack, and uh, wreaks havoc, I think would be the most appropriate term. So in the, in the next couple of scenes, we see the, the Ramphorhynchus, you know, it swoops down and attacks some people every now and then. We see that the plesiosaur can get out of the water and lumber around a little bit. It attacks our, our lead actress while she is taking a shower. I did not include that scene. Um, and 
she and her ex-boyfriend go, uh, they, they're separated from the larger group of people trying to track down these monsters. And just at this time, Mount Fuji decides to erupt. And so we have our two leads on their own, caught with a pterosaur and a plesiosaur in a volcanic eruption. And uh, that's the next clip. They got separated, so they're, they're looking for each other amidst all the chaos. The song that's going to play over this entire clip, um, which I cut off at the beginning to avoid any copyright issues that might arise, <laughs> Um, was a single that Toei put out to promote the film. And look, they found each other. By the way, this is the rest of the movie. We follow the uh, plesiosaur to its demise. But we don't really see uh, what happens to the, the Rampharynchus. It's just not really addressed. It can fly, so it probably flew away. We're halfway through this clip, and the rest of it is them uh, dangling. dramatically dangling. A lot of people who, who grew up with this movie, which I was not fortunate enough to do, uh, they saw it on a VHS tape from a company called Just For Kids. Yeah. Uh, and uh, this... Uh, Instead of dying a few feet apart, they can die together. And the triumphant music swells. This same stock footage would be used for the Sandy Frank versions of the opening credits the Gamera vs. Gauss. And oh, are in the end. So that was uh, The Legend of Dinosaurs and Monster Birds, which once again featured neither dinosaurs nor monster birds. Uh, not a huge success in Japan, took almost 10 full years to come to the US. But once again, huge, huge hit in the Soviet Union. Uh, it's a very bleak film, as a lot of 70s Japanese movies are. Uh, 
I think there was doom and gloom on the mind of film producers as their industry was going under. Uh, Toei would pretty much stick to TV for the rest of the 70s and into the 80s. Uh, Toho quit doing the big expensive movies and started getting into kind of the things like uh, Pinky Violence, Samurai Film. They did the Lone Wolf and Cub live action movies. And most of the other studios either went, o went under or started making pornography. So uh, that is the main part of our little little show here. Does anyone have any questions about the film that we've discussed today? The movie is uh, rough. I think it's about eighty minutes. So, and there's I, I did cherry pick. The, so I think the opening sequence and the plesiosaur attack are actually the best scenes in the film, genuinely. They're, but the, the rest of what I showed you, I mean, this, this was kind of the highlight. These are the highlights of the movie. I do recommend seeing the whole thing because it is baffling. Yes? Uh, is this first work uh, pre-made or all after? This is well after Rodin. This film is uh, 20 years after Rodin, actually. Rodin came out in 1957, originally. Yeah. Uh, uh, was the choice of uh, jazz music for the attacks normal for monster movies at the time? Nothing was normal for monster movies at the time. There, there, was, there was a very brief period where giant monster movies had a formula, which was largely defined by the Gamera series that started in the mid-60s. Gamera had not released a film in six years. The Godzilla franchise had been done for two years at this point. No, there was no clear direction for these sorts of things. And uh, everyone was trying something to either stand out or, or start something, and nothing really took. What was very normal was having a single placed uh, in the film, like the, the song we heard over the end where they just reach for each other for five minutes. Yeah? Uh, let's say, uh, first of all, uh, it seems like we have this item of the first person possibly would be in the end of the giant condor. So uh, the interesting thing about bringing that up, the giant condor is actually a Rodin flying prop that they put feathers on. Uh, in God, that's in Godzilla vs. the Sea Monster. This is designed after the real-life pterosaur Ramphorhynchus, uh, which had very prominent teeth and uh, a long, like, you know, stereotypical devil tail with the, like, almost the spade shape at the end. Uh, it's oversized for what a Ramphorhynchus would have been. I think uh, an actual Ramphorhynchus would have been, like, you know, maybe up to an eight foot wingspan, four feet tall. Oh, oh, the, the giant claw. The giant claw, yes, it does. There is a resemblance to the giant claw, for sure. Uh, which also got recently a, a stunning Blu ray release from Arrow Films as part of a set called uh, Adam Age Monsters, I think. Any other questions? All right, we do have a game show. That is a staple here at Record All Monsters. Is anyone volunteering to play today? All right, come on up here. You have the opportunity today. If you could stay on that side, please. Uh, you have the opportunity to win this Time Life Godzilla publication from a few years ago, a copy of my book, a copy of Return of the Dinosaurs edited by Mike Resnick, and a copy of this very film on a double feature with Octoman. Can't wait. So today's game, uh, as I noted before, or today's film, I should say, as I noted before, features neither 
dinosaurs nor monster birds. Uh, and it's very common for various prehistoric reptiles to be referred to as dinosaurs when they are in fact not. What our game today, which it's called Dino Sure or Dinosaur. Uh, I'm going to give you the name of a prehistoric reptile. Its silhouette will be on the screen. And you have to tell me if it is a dinosaur or a dinosaur. All right, we're clear? Got it. Okay. Our, and you will be timed. Our first creature, Cryodracon Boreas from the late Cretaceous Canada. Can't, can't quite make it out from this angle. I'm going to say dinosaur. Dinosaur? You're correct! That was an Asdarkin pterosaur related to Quetzalcoatlus, which was uh, in, local to our region. Our next beastie is Epidexterterix Huey from the Middle Jurassic in China. Once again, it's kind of hard to make out the silhouette, but uh, I'm going to go with dinosaur. Dinosaur is what we're saying. All right. It was a dino, sure, from the. It was a par avian dinosaur. Those are the ones that were very directly. Uh, Leading to birds. Yeah, it looks like a rat. Yep. Our next creature, Desmatosuchus spirensis from the late Triassic in the southwestern United States. Dinosaur. Dinosaur, yeah. yeah. No, wait, no. No? I think I'm going to change my answer to Dinosaur. Dinosaur, you're saying? It was a dinosaur. Is a Pseudoscythian archosaur, an ancestor of modern crocodiles. So you're, uh, you're one and two. Poposaurus gracilis, also from the late Triassic southwestern United States. Dino sure. Dino sure, let's see. I did two in a row, they're both Pseudoscythian archosaurs. This it is our last question, and I'll, I'll let you, if you get this one right, you can still win the game, we'll say. Becomastax Africana, early Jurassic Southern Africa. Dino Sure. Dino Sure, let's see. Hey, Dino Sure. Uh, it was a heterodontrosaurid dinosaur. That means. Uh, same toothed lizard, because all their teeth were the same. And, or, I'm sorry, different tooth, because all their teeth were different. That's what I mean. So you win, uh, you win the film, the books, and the magazine. Thank you, it's an honor. You're welcome. Enjoy them. Uh, we are on all of the major social media things. And uh, if you scan the QR code, you can find our various online presences and give me money at Patreon or buy the book yourself on Amazon or the film we just watched if you're interested in it. And with that, I'd like to remind you that uh, monsters are your friends. And uh, I, I have two more copies of my book. If you'd like to buy it from me, it's $10, uh, which is the same price as Amazon, but without tax. So thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it. And, uh, yeah, thank you.